Rhode Island company? That's because 11 towns. Yeah. 11 yeah. towns. Yeah. For a very long time, I hated to be able to get everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. So it was nice. Yeah. 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 And then we have a quorum. And South Carolina is here. Right now? Yeah. You're here, so we have a quorum. Yeah, there's enough. Uh, here, I thought you just came over here to sit near me. Oh, I like that, too, because that's a little bit easy. Majority of the Boston, so it's a good mix. No, oh, I've never been over here. You're both in the series. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. We're, good. We're good. How about you? This is dangerous. Um, we're staying home this year. I don't know if that's a lot. I guess that's probably not a lot. That's what I thought, too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's exactly what I thought. Yeah, she's just coming to learn about it. She was here the last time. On the ground, but not the alphabet. You're going to go to North Carolina in June. Oh, man. 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 I was thinking, do I want to go at five by the day? I don't want to do that early. <laughs> I'm going to go home as soon as there's a meeting to go to. You came with Jeff. I am your role. Oh, uh, I'm just like, I'm just like, Hey, well, nice Welcome to the big kids' hey, table. Better late than so, never. Huh? Yeah. A, a lot of pressure. I you know, at some point, you need the brown blood. Oh, you better. I think I throw Catherine right into the fire. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's good. Yeah, we'll let anybody vote no. It was perfect. It was almost done. I walked in. I'm just like. Supposed to be, when you go in, you're supposed to act like you planned it that way. Like I was. You planned it that way. Yeah, yeah. Old well, names are hard to. <laughs> Details. Yeah. I know. I, we're still going to call Dorset Park. Park. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's get the show on the road here. Yeah. Let's see, because I didn't like that. Oh, let's turn around that time. How are you doing? It never does. Oh. You're fired. Bad yeah. I almost was. <laughs> okay, let's get the meeting started the uh, July 17th meeting and uh, we'll start with changes to the agenda changes next item is uh, did I miss the consent agenda no consent. Consent. no consent okay next item is public comment period for items not on the agenda anyone from the public want to make any comments to the board don't see anything so we'll move on approval of the minutes of June 19th 2019 annual meeting Second. Motion from Jeff, second from Andy. Any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? I'll abstain. Abstentions? Abstain. And who's that, John, Barbara, and Don? And Don. I just want to note they were two short of <laughs> Okay, next item we have autonomous vehicles. Joe Sigali. Welcome, Joe. Hi, thanks. Do I need to, Charlie, get, uh, what's the, uh, I definitely need it. Right there, just hit the hat. Put the mute button, Charlie. Um, no, you have to have this done automatically or we're just not gonna like, I know, see what happens when humans get involved? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 yeah. it's coming up. It's coming on. It's coming up. It's coming. Warm it up. Okay. All right. Open up to a climate. <laughs> All right. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Joe Sigali. Joe, as we go through this, do you want questions as you go through or you want to wait to the end? Um, I, so you only have 20 minutes, right? Right. So let me get, let me get through it and then, uh, and then we'll have questions and discussion. Okay. Sounds good. So um, I'm Joe Sigali. I'm the Director of Policy Planning and Research at the Vermont Agency of Transportation. And I'm going to talk, give you some background information on automated vehicles and talk about the um, law that got passed this year by the legislature to the self-driving, uh, 
automated uh, vehicle driving app that allows for the testing of automated vehicles on public roads in Vermont. And I want to talk about the role of municipalities is in that process, but um, I think it's good for me to give you a little bit of background information first, just so it, hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. But I won't be going into tons and tons of detail about automated vehicles. Um, so what this slide shows um, are some, some of the technology that's on automated vehicles. It includes LiDAR, which basically sends out a point cloud and that can understand sort of three-dimensionally the objects that are in front of it. Radar, which um, allows measuring of distance. There's other cameras on board. There's obviously um, artificially intelligent software on board that's interpreting all that information and all these things together are the automated driving system. Um, and uh, there are, the, the convention right now is to talk about different levels of automation and level zero is basically conventional car and the, the human is in complete control. Level one is driver assisted vehicles and an example of that is um, uh, cruise control or it's it's kind of staying in one direction that's a very you know rudimentary type of, of um, automation partial automation a little bit more um, options um, the vehicle could could actually not just go in one direction but might be able to move in different directions not just in one plane for example self parking cars um, but in that case obviously the human clearly is still in control and what the um, what the legislation addresses are levels three four and five um, so a level three vehicle, uh, automated driving system, the system itself has the ability to carry out the complete dynamic driving task, as it's called, and that means it's the ability to interpret the environment around it and make decisions about what to do and how to react to what's happening um, around it, just like you can as a human. You see a pedestrian come out in the street, you know you should slow down. Um, you see other vehicles and you know how to interpret and, and, and you are sort of going through the calculation of how fast is that vehicle going, can I, you know, can I pull out ahead of that vehicle and so on. So it has the, com the complete ability to make all of those decisions and actually control the vehicle. Um, the, the key difference between a level three um, system and a level four and five is that the, hu the human is always the fallback. So if the system fails in some way, it's the human that, it, that is responsible for putting the vehicle in what's called a minimal risk condition. And that might mean they're taking over control of operating the vehicle or that they need to get it on the side of the road. Um, a level four uh, system has, uh, can completely drive the vehicle. Um, the difference is that it's, it's, it, it happens within what's called an operational design domain. So for example, it might just be on the interstate. Uh, or it might be only during daylight hours. So, um, or it might only be in decent weather uh, or day, yeah, daytime. So, but while it's operating, the system itself has the ability to put the vehicle in a minimal risk condition. So the system has the fallback control. In situations like that, um, the human may take over the vehicle at some point, but it's not required when the vehicle is operating where it's supposed to be operating. Um, and so it can get into uh, minimal risk condition. And then level five is um, complete self-driving vehicle, meaning the human never needs to um, uh, control the vehicle and humans are really only passengers. And it may not, actually not just be humans, it may be commodities that are being moved by, the, by these vehicles. So the legislation that was passed, again, just to remind you, has to do with level three, four, and five and allowing the testing of those um, on, uh, on public roads in Vermont. And I will say, if you read the legislation, it's Act 60 this, and it's sections 16 through 18, you won't see reference to level three, four, and five, but you will see reference to the terms that I was using, dynamic driving <coughs> task, minimal risk condition, and so on. Because these are, well, these are standard, not, these are recommended practice right now. Um, the legislation really goes to the function, so if these definitions kind of shift a little bit in the industry, that it's still kind of, it's resilient to those sorts of changes. Um, so, you know, the common question is, well, how fast are these vehicles going to be on, on the roadways? And this, uh, this was a, a forecast that was done by the National Governor Highway Safety Association, looking at price points and, you know, the way technology has been adopted and, and so on. And, and they're estimating, you know, in the 2020s, so the next decade, you know, maybe 1% to 2% of the vehicles on the road will have some level of that of automated driving system, three, four, or five. 
And you know, one to two percent doesn't sound very much, but when you think about electric vehicle penetration, right, it's really, really low. One to two percent in Vermont is, is let's see, we have six, is like almost a million registered cars. I mean, you know, so you, there's a good chance you're going to see some of these cars out there <coughs> next decade. By out to the 2050s, it's maybe 40 to 60 percent of the fleet um, out there on the roads will have some level of driving automation. And one of the key takeaways here is, first of all. Probably conventional vehicles are not going to completely go away, at least according to this forecast. And there's going to be a mix of these different levels of automation on the highway system. So something we really need to think about is, in a lot of ways, driving um, is going to be becoming more complicated, not less complicated, because there's just going to be all these different systems. Now, some might argue that this is a pretty conservative forecast. Um, there's another forecast that, I, that I've talked about um, I think it's called Rethink X is the is the think tank that did it that you know, they claim that they they projected the the smartphone growth and how fast that was going to happen and their argument is is that you know if these if if self driving cars become shared vehicles the cost is going to decrease significantly relative to you know the cost to own a vehicle you know anywhere between five thousand and ten thousand dollars per year per household and if that really happens and the technology kind of kind of works the way some people hope it will, that the, that the shift could be a lot faster. And, but still, there's, there's going to be some mix of, I think, all these vehicles on the road for, at least in our typical planning horizon, right, you know, five to 20 years. So, you know, in the transportation industry, um, the, the reason that most transportation people are, are, are really interested in this, besides the fact that it's just coming at us, we're not really controlling it, is that you know this is the number of fatalities on U.S. highways in 2017, and there's a lot more other you know serious injuries that happen as well, and the, and 90 something percent of these are related to human error, right, or human behavior. So the thought is, well, if you can remove the human from the equation, hopefully we can start to make a dent in this because we've kind of leveled out in our ability, you know, with current technology and current drivers to reduce the number of crashes. And the number of crashes is now starting to go back up with vehicle miles of travel, where it was, it's been flat, you know, it was, it's been actually declining significantly over, you know, many decades, and now it's kind of like starting to go up again. And talk generally about some of the impacts. So I, there's kind of these two big scenarios. One is that everybody, every individual continues to own their own self-driving vehicle. You know, so each household has two of these. And you know, becomes easier to go places, so there's just going to be a lot more of these vehicles on the road. And this is a, obviously a pretty expensive model. The other scenario on the right, and that is a self-driving shuttle, is that um, we'll have some sort of shared system. If you think about Uber, Lyft now, it's something similar to that, and it's referred to as mobility as a service, except there won't be a human in the vehicle. You know, and Uber is now testing automated vehicles in Pittsburgh. You can, you can get on board, you can actually uh, try this out if you're in, the, in that city, and there's a bunch of cities that are testing these now. So if it's a shared model, the cost will go down, um, but you know, especially in a rural area, will this work for us? I'm not really sure. You know, the, I think the opportunity is, is like, it's expensive to, to provide rural transit, right? And a big part of the cost is the, um, is the driver. And so, you know, you remove the driver from the equation and it starts to become much more, much more affordable to expand transit everywhere and, and to make it much more flexible, right? So it's, it's truly on demand. I mean, the on-demand service we have now, it's not that bad, right? But you generally have to plan, you know, the special uh, services uh, transit. You have to plan ahead, like, like a day, you know, or more. I mean, this still could be like very much on demand. It might actually work in a rural area. So keep that in mind when we think about testing. Um, so we did, uh, we had a big stakeholder meeting in November of 2016 with the, with the annual meeting of the Vermont Highway Safety Alliance. They had a lot of emergency responders and planners and academics and others there. And we, we, we were talking about this and, um, you know, the concerns are how do you, you know, granted, a lot of people die on, on the highways in the U.S., but this is complicated technology. How do we sort of manage through the transition because it's complicated? Uh, most agree that Vermont should require a permit for testing on, uh, of automated vehicles on public roads. That seemed kind of obvious to me, maybe because I'm a bureaucrat, I don't know, but you know, there are states that really just, that they don't require a permit, and they just let their existing laws stand, and they're maybe not as concerned about what's happening out there with these. Um, 
in the long term, automated vehicles are going to be important to Vermont's economy. And, then, and that we should start doing something actively to prepare. And so this kind of came out of the, the legislature asked us two years ago to go out and talk to people and kind of see what, what they felt about this. Um, so thinking about what the federal and state role is here and municipal role to some extent, just as big pictures, this really is not going to change a lot. At the, federal, at the federal level, they're responsible for the equipment, the vehicles, the equipment, ensure, and ensuring that they're safe, um, generally educating the public about vehicles and different you know, issue, issuing different guidance and so on. At the state role, we have a lot to do. You know, we issue licenses for the operators. We do education and training, driver training. We register vehicles. We regulate uh, motor vehicle insurance and liability. Um, we do safety inspections. Um, and, and at the state and local level, we establish and enforce traffic laws, um, and we build and, and maintain the infrastructure, right? So these are all areas that are going to be a touched by automation in some fashion. So over the last, I don't know, five, four or five years, there's really been a proliferation of legislation across um, the different states. You can see in 2016 that the gray is where there's not legislation or executive orders, and on the right, um, you can see it's kind of spreading throughout the nation. And this was in 2018, so this is still a little bit dated. We're shown as blue, Vermont's shown as blue, and that's because that, there was some legislation um, in 2016 just telling us to go talk to people. <laughs> but, so just take a little bit of grain of salt of this, but people are, you know, the states are thinking about this. At the federal level, there was legislation that made it out of the House in, I think, 2017. Um, Self-Drive Act, which is a, also a really long acronym for something, and it did make it through the Senate, and you know now they, they kind of have to start over. And but the the tendency is to you know be technology neutral, uh, make sure that you allow for innovation, and don't be too prescriptive is kind of where they were coming from. Um, but we still you know you go back and think about what the state and federal role is. The, the feds are really about the vehicle equipment and making it safe, and we're about everything else. So it's you know, even though there's concern about a patchwork, it's hard for there not to be a patchwork because we're all somewhat different. Um, so uh, S149, which it was part, this is the annual uh, DMV miscellaneous bill. It had a bunch of other things in it. Um, but sections 16 and 18 are called the um, Automated Vehicle Act. And um, so I think there's a good question about, you know, why would we want to allow testing on our roads to start with? and you know, it's first of all to facilitate the deployment in Vermont. We really want to encourage testers to come here and, and, and run these vehicles in our environment just because our context is different than other places. I mean, you know, yeah, we're similar to New Hampshire, we're similar to upstate New York, and they have some of the same challenges in Maine and so on, but, um, you know, it's sort of like we don't want to fall behind this technology. Um, we also want Vermonters to have some experience and start to build some confidence with it, to be able to touch the technology and think about it. Um, we want to provide a clear process for testers, and, and we want a publicly transparent process on the testing. You know, in Arizona, they allowed testing, and there wasn't really an open process, and, you know, some of the residents are throwing things at these vehicles, you know, there's, uh, you know rocks and things like that, because they're, they're, they might move a little different, and they're just frustrated with them. So, and, you know, and we have a long tradition of public input in Vermont, so we're trying to respect that. So, okay, there's a lot here. Um, so the, um, the board that will approve the testing permits is the traffic committee, and that includes the Secretary of Transportation, the Commissioner of DMV, and the Commissioner of Public Safety. Um, so that's a standing you know, committee that you, know, you, you might be most familiar with them on setting speed limits, right, when you want to change the speed limit in your town on a state highway. They do some other things as well. So the traffic committee can issue a permit without any sort of municipal input for testing of automated vehicles on the state highway system, which includes the interstate, you know, U.S. and Vermont numbered routes, and also class one town highways. So that's the continuation of a, you know, U.S. or Vermont numbered route through a town that's still under, it's under municipal jurisdiction, but the thought was we wanted to make sure there was some continuity. Um, so if the testing is, if a tester wants to be on a municipal road, a class two, three, or four municipal or town highway, then it does require pre-approval by the um, municipality. Um, so, and this was, we, there was a lot of back and forth on this one with the legislature, but, um, you know, 
basically the, the way it's supposed to work is I need to start to recruit municipalities that are willing to be automated vehicle testing municipalities and try to do that ahead of time. And so we'll have a bank of municipalities that say these are these are places that you know are welcoming you, welcoming you, and you can come and test your vehicles there, as long as you get a permit from the traffic committee. Um, there will be uh, you know a public process while the traffic committee is reviewing and issuing those permits. Municipalities can pull out whenever they want, which is uh, that's that's a little bit dicey, right? I mean, because a, a tester makes a lot of investments. In, in coming here and a municipality decides at the last minute to pull out, they actually can still do that, but the legislature just felt really, you know, um, strongly that, you know, it's about local control. Um, municipalities can approve a testing, testing on their own, right? So a municipality can certainly seek out testers and decide they want to be a testing community, but still the traffic committee needs to approve the, the permit. Um, so we're, we're charged, the Agency of Transportation is charged with developing a testing guidance, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and the, app, the actual application process, and we have, we have till January 2021 um, to do that. Um, so it's, it's still a little ways out, but I wanted enough time to kind of put it together and to recruit municipalities. Um, so any state or local law enforcement officer may stop a specific AV test vehicle um, when it's out on the road, but the traffic committee is the only one that has the authority to actually um, uh, make the entire permit void. Um, I think those are the main highlights. And then some other things about the, the, the testing entity itself. So the hu a human operator has to be in the vehicle at all time and be able to take over control. So that's regardless if it's a level three, four, and five. And this again, there was some back and forth on this one. I kind of was hoping that we would allow the vehicle to be, you know, possibly you could take it over remotely, but the, um, uh, what, some of the legislators just weren't comfortable with that. They said, let's give this some time and see how it works. Um, you have to have, uh, so the operator must be at least 21 years old. The operator must pass a background check and they can't have a blood alcohol contact uh, more than 0 0.02, which I think that's, that's the level for school bus and commercial vehicles. Um, there's $5 million of liability insurance. You know, there's different, I guess, ways you can provide that letter of credit or whatever, but $5 million of insurance is required. Um, the vehicle has to be able to comply with all state and local laws, um, and then the, the testing vehicle must be clearly identifiable, which you would think that would be a logical thing, but the, um, you know, the industry is not that excited about that. They would prefer that, that, that drivers don't know that's a self-driving vehicle, so, when they're, in the ve so they're, when they're in the traffic stream, you're not acting differently. But again, for now, you know, I think it kind of makes sense. That's actually a, um, I think it's in Michigan, they, uh, Pizza Hut is, is testing out self-driving vehicles to deliver their pizzas. Um, so this is just a quick overview of the, the guidance that we're, gonna, that we're putting together. Um, I won't go through all of these, but lots of, well, not lots, but several other states have similar guidance, so we'll, we'll be drawing from that. And this is really the specifics of the information that has to be provided for the permit so that when the traffic committee and is reviewing it, you know, based on staff review, that they feel confident that, you know, they can allow these vehicles on the highways. And just looking down the road a little bit in terms of, you know, a year or two, a lot of, many states are actually not just allowing testing, but they're developing legislation that allows for the use of these vehicles once they're on the market. <coughs> so we just, you know, in some ways this was a learning year. We wanted the, the legislature to understand kind of what the complexities are here. And, but I think it's not unreasonable to think in a couple of years we will start, we'll have some legislation that allows the use of these vehicles. It's called deployment but by the general public. And, you know, we have to think about who the operator is, especially when, this, when it's shifting from a human to the system. You know, um, uh, lots of other things there. But, you know, there's, like, there's a law in the books right now that you can't have basically an idling car, right? Well, these vehicles, if they can drive themselves, they won't have an operator in them. And, you know, the way the legislation is written now or statutes are written now, that's not allowed. So there's, there's some specifics like that we have to deal with. But really, it's like who, and also who's liable? That, that's also a big question. When, when the operator is switching from the human to the system, you know, and if it's the system that's operating the vehicle, is it the manufacturer of that system that's liable if there's a, if there's a collision? And so there's some models out there 
but that's going to just take a lot more time to kind of figure it out. And we're we're working with our neighbor neighbor states to really think about you know where should we be consistent across some of these things as well. Um, and the last thing I'll say is you know we may want to you know. I, had, I got a couple calls from testers. One was from a, someone that wants to do a commercial vehicle test, a truck test, and they're, they're working out in Calif California now and they're thinking about the Eastern Seaboard. Another one was from a, a company that's working in, um, in Boston and they have, they're running a test right now. And the guy, you know, he has a connection to Vermont, right? Just that's kind of like the Vermont story. So I was like, well, you know, this would be great to test these vehicles in Vermont. So I think there might be some interest, but I think we'll have to sort of take the initiative and maybe like Rhode Island DOT is running a shuttle in Providence right now. Maybe we want to do something similar like that and take the initiative ourselves. So that's it. I mean, I, I could use some help with thinking about how I reach out to municipalities, recruit some municipalities. And, and I mean, I know there's going to be some skepticism, but um, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I just have a question. Is all the technology now being designed to be on board, or is the infrastructure also going to have to be upgraded with some kind of embedded technology improvements to handle these things? There Maybe might be a... Town, yeah. Infrastructure side of things. I mean, I, our, our response to that is you, you, just, you cannot depend on our infrastructure. You can't, you know, it, it, these vehicles are not going to work. I mean, think about gravel roads, 8,000 miles of gravel roads in Vermont. And, and if they're going to be ubiquitous, they've got to be able to handle those kinds of conditions. So just like you as a human can interpret, I'm on a gravel road and I can kind of see it's, you know, I see the ditches and I, it's got to be able to do that. And that's a big issue around the country. Like California up there, the, the width of their edge lines, white edge lines from like four inches to six inches. Well, that's a, that's a huge amount of money, right? And maybe some of that needs to be done initially to help with the transition, but in the long run, they have to just be able to interpret and work on the roads that are out there. Same with navigation. I mean, GPS cuts out a lot in mountainous terrains. So. Right. Well, you know, and, and the human ends up getting lost. But the vehicle itself <laughs> is, you know, able to look, you know, in the environment around it and, you know, it's like, well, I'm lost. I don't know where to go next. And it's going to stop and, you know. Detours. Yeah. <laughs> try, do, try going through the detour uh, up in Montreal with an oh, AI. Oh, oh. <laughs> I can't yeah, even tell yeah. you where you are in the GPS. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's, I didn't talk about the whole other connected vehicle side of it, which is, you know, so the vehicle is being connected to traffic signals. So it slows down, so it hits it when it's green instead of red, but also connected to work zones. And that might be technology we would want to get out there as soon as possible, and that might be some of the early technology. Even if it's not a self-driving car, connected technology is going to be available on other vehicles sooner than the full automation. So, I mean, I think there's value in us making investments that improve safety in certain places like that. But overall, they kind of have to take what's, what we have available and work with it. So what, do you, what do you see is a couple of the benefits of being an early adapter as a municipality versus what you feel might be the downsides if you were a municipality um, looking at this? Well, that's a really great question. Yeah, I mean, I, you know what? I, I haven't tried to push this too much. I mean, my only thing I can say is that you get to be on the cutting edge of this technology and to be a leading community, community in it. I think you know the risk might be if a crash happens in your community, and it is related to these vehicles. That's going to be a tough thing, right? Because the select board or city council or whatever is you know going to have said, yeah, we're okay with this, and um, you know, so yeah, I think that's probably the main downside. If, if something bad happens, you're kind of on the hook for that. Other questions? Yes, it's Chris. Yes, municipalities, it would seem that, you know, Burlington, South Burlington have uh, probably the opportunity for people who are coming in as tourists, the l number of hotels in South Burlington, and certainly the growing number of hotels in downtown Burlington would be the two communities to start with uh, as far as talking to their DPWs and, you know, asking them, what do you see for traffic, you know, getting down and dirty with a, a larger cities in the state? Uh, to figure out what they see. And then, yes, there are smaller communities that have the same thing. If you go to Northfield and you ask them, you know, what happens, who gets stuck, where do they get stuck on the mud roads in March and April? Um, you know, talking to the DPW foreman uh, and folks of that sort, I think 
would give you some decent feedback uh, as a sampling of the other uh, right. more rural towns and, and certainly the smaller sized towns as well. And yeah, I don't know how to kick it to the select boards or councils, you know, uh, because they'll not necessarily give you the short answers or. or I need to think about my response to your question. I think, yeah. you know, um, I sort of had this thought that one of our, you know, there's like I said, shuttles being run in, in Providence, Rhode Island, and other places, and I think. In Vermont, maybe we should be thinking about a shuttle that runs from Huntington to Burlington, you know, or, Hun or Huntington to the park and ride, you know, and, and how can that work in a rural area? And I think that's something we can learn from in that. And then, you know, slowly ramp that up, you know, on, in bad weather, you know, and, and that sort of stuff. And um, because I think there's huge opportunities for us in a rural state, you know, ultimately in the long run. And then some of the questions I had, they had a category, and you probably can tell me quickly, for the emergency vehicle, first responders, interactions. You know, it said the police officer can pull over a vehicle. Um, if it's the vehicle's fully automated and there's no way for the human to uh, control it, how does the vehicle know that versus uh, pulling over to allow emergency vehicle to go by? Officer gets out, vehicle takes off. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, there was an incident where there was some level of self-driving vehicle on the road. <clears throat> I think the driver had fallen asleep or something. And, and the police were trying to pull it over, and they just pulled out in front of it until they stopped. <laughs> so that's like a simple way to do it. But in the long term, um, you know, it's, this is the connected vehicle technology again. I think the vehicle has to be stoppable by law enforcement, which means some sort of connectivity and control. And, no. yeah. and, and then similarly, talk about level three, four, and five for the legislature. It sounds like we require it in our legislature that it have a human operator in control. Yes. We aren't going to have level five vehicles in this state, according to that. Uh, well, case. that's for testing purposes. Um, so in, in the automobile, uh, the American Automobile Alliance kind of made that argument. They said, you know, basically by always requiring a human in the vehicle, you're never really going to see a testing of a, of a fully self-driving vehicle. I guess I see it as let's get the ball rolling, and we can you know we can change that legislation after there's after we show some confidence, right? You know they didn't like it the other way, which is like just trust us, let us give us that flexibility first, and then you can change it later. Now let the machines take over. Yeah. <laughs> so you kind of made some reference to you just about being on the hook, and I get that from a public relations standpoint. But is there liability protection in here, like financially? Is there a financial risk to a municipality that says it? I don't, you know, my take on it, and I'm sure someone, you know, that is not the law than I do, is that that's what the liability insurance is for. I mean, no more, you shouldn't be any more liable than you are now, right? I mean, if, if you were to, if a municipality was to, you know, dig a hole to replace a culvert and they left that hole wide open some night, you know, that's, they might be liable in that particular case. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about other yeah. actions, but just allowing yeah. AV testing in your town and the AV operator does something bad. The answer, Charlie, is the lawyer will sue the town. Well, to the judge to dismiss whether or not the town is actually liable. Because the lawyer will come after everybody. It's just the way it works. America, that's right. <laughs> but um, I don't but there wasn't anything that. specifically in the bill that... that Held them harmless. That, yeah, that gives protection to towns to do that. It, it would seem to me, I mean... You know, we have all had situations of bad accidents in our towns, and, you know, typically they don't get sued. I mean, like you said, I mean, they'll grab whoever they can. So I would imagine it would <coughs> fall under similar guidelines. Anybody interested? Anybody real? <laughs> Are there any select board city council members on? Mm -hmm. uh, How about Vermont League of Cities and Towns? Have you talked with them? Well, they were definitely involved with that. Making sure the municipalities were going to have a say in this <laughs> during the, while the legislation was being developed. Um, Any other questions? I think Joe, generally, you know, like you know, as you start to, you know, work on the story here, and yeah, you know, happy to take it around to towns or do whatever. I, I will say that you know, the uh, particularly at the House Transportation Committee was really insistent that the regional planning commissions be involved in helping us sort of pull this together and find municipalities that, that are willing to, you know, participate. And, and so I think that's where I really should be working is with you guys, at, probably at the staff level, and see what, how we can craft a message. Yeah. And I, I'll, I go around to each of the boards in the fall, 
So if there is, I mean, I can at least plant a seed. It That'll doesn't sound great. like we're going to be probably over the course of the next 18 months really right. working on who's ready, right? Right. Okay. Jeff? It strikes me there's a, a, a time window that's, I don't know if it's here, but, you know, the AI is progressing at kind of very quick pace. Yeah. Okay. Have the legislative committees or is your shop um, kind of looked at this and determined that there's a minimum technology threshold um, to incur, you know, and what's the timing of the testing? Is it six months? Is it 12 months? Is it 18 months? Is it 24 months? I mean, you're going to do your book right. by January of 2021. Does that coincide with when there's going to be an effort to at least establish a timeline for when we'd allow this testing? You mean how long the testing would be on well, no, the road? No, I'm talking about when does the when when does the AI involved in this meet the minimum threshold that would allow for safe testing? And has somebody made that determination? Or is well, it's happening. The testing is happening around the country now. I know, but in different limited environments. I mean, if you're doing yeah. it in Boston and Pittsburgh, you're doing it in an urban environment. Yeah. Okay. And I'm just wondering, is, has anybody here decided that, well, before we allow it to happen outside of Burlington or South Burlington, you know, is there some minimum level of technology that needs to be achieved? Is there anybody capable of looking at that? I mean, here's where I'm coming from. In my community, we don't have bus service for school kids. They all walk to school in the village. If we've got autonomous vehicles running around and there's little pint-sized kids walking across streets, right. even with crossing guards, that's a cause for concern. Yeah, you know, th this might be an over oversimplification, but um, you know, what I saw as a requirement in the other testing guidance around the country is that they have to, the tester will have to demonstrate that they have run these vehicles in similar environments. So that might mean, like if we want vehicles run on gravel roads, well maybe they did a test up at the you know, firing range. I don't know. They have to. They have to show that it. You know, place th that they tested it in very similar environments. So, that's the that's the only answer I can give you. I, I can't really say what level of AI is required. It's like it's more like how do they actually operate? And can they operate in the conditions that you're going to be testing them on the road? Well, and, it almost seemed to me that we need to have some comfort that the AI is going to work. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, and you know, it can't be a fresh start. We haven't. You know. Yeah. And there's a there's a there's a risk to be in the first combined kind of semi-urban, semi-rural place if it hasn't been tested there. And who wants to go first? Who wants to be the first one to allow them to run around their streets where nowadays people are walking like this with their heads buried in their phone, not paying attention, thinking the cars are going to stop for them when they step off the curb. Well, I, I think if you look at it in, in a different direction, too, one of the values we may have is unique environments, and I'm thinking mud. I mean, well, it can, it, are there areas that um, a company would be wanting to try where, like, my Honda can't go? You know, if you've got a, you a four-wheel drive truck, you, you know with certain roads you can't go on. How does the autonomous vehicle understand when it hits that road that, you know, mud is basically solid. So how, how does this LiDAR work to tell it it can't go over that road? Um, and we can, uh, so that doesn't mean they have to be running around everywhere. They, there may be three roads in a neighborhood that are a perfect test ground for that kind of thing during a certain time of the year. And you can actually market that to them. There may be some economic opportunity here as well. It will learn. I mean, so the first automated vehicle that gets stuck in the mud is going to share that experience with every other automated vehicle. Whereas each human so that gets stuck, <laughs> each human that gets stuck in the mud has to pass it down right. generation by generation, right. and, 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 right. you know, and, 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 and providing a, an environment where that might be able to happen to be tested. That's not quote running around. It's it, they're doing a test in a certain neighborhood. Yeah. Could but be Usually, it's not operatorless, correct? Right. So I mean, test, there, yeah. there is somebody who so, is controlling. Except has, if the operators play Madden or something like that. Well, it's, well yeah, it's yeah but that's no different than regular drivers who are <laughs> <laughs> right. doing things they shouldn't be I, doing. I think we're kind of... <laughs> Well, no, I, no, no, I understand, but we're time, I'm less concerned I understand about a vehicle you, getting stuck in the mud and learning how not to do that than drilling a three-year-old on the way to school. I understand that, what, but we're, we're kind of getting off on tangents here about what, what could and couldn't happen, and I think, going back to what Barbara was saying, the testing phase is going to be a driver there, and they're going to be, if I heard you right, Joe, those people are going to have to pass some kind of a 
test or certification right. that they're going to be in charge of the vehicle if it gets off the road. So. And I'm going to suggest to Joe that you know maybe UVM would be a good place, but they have a transportation group to you know, see if there was something there for trial one that would work within the campus yeah. network for that. But college being back, right. uh, not that college students are expendable. <laughs> you might be able to find operators, you know, relatively available, you know, right. to, to be there and it, to have it in a very contested environment without having it off track and otherwise going places you wouldn't necessarily want it to go. Yeah. Yeah. I go ahead, probably Mark. missed this, but what was the time frame that you would be looking for municipalities to be signing up? Well, so the law basically says when I publish the guidance so 20, by 20, 2021, I need okay. to include towns that have decided to, you know, participate. I mean, if no towns decide to participate, I mean, still have the option of doing it on the state state route system. How do you do one without one. the other? How do you decide whether you want to participate with the guidelines without the guidelines? Well, I mean, I can I can describe what the you know the de you know, enough details in the guide. I'm working on that now. Right. I mean, we'll have that as a draft, but. I would also want to add, uh, addressing your concern, Jeff, is a lot of these, a lot of the, you know, some of the technology even now, a lot of these cars are full of warning lights and like you need to have both hands on the wheel. If you don't, it shoots off the lights, sets off an alarm. Perhaps that would alleviate some of these safety concerns if there's enough feedback within the, within the car where if the driver does decide, oh, they're going to play John Madden football, the car will scream at it. You know, there's, there's definitely the technology exists for that to happen now in the Teslas and things like that. And maybe, maybe some additional legislation there where we would tell them that there needs to be some sort of system in there to keep the driver paying attention. And that Pennsylvania has that in their guidance. They're, they have some specifics about what's required to be able to make sure the driver is, you know, notified to be able to take over control. Okay. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you in Essex. Then. Yeah. <laughs> Next item is the uh, 2023 Transportation Improvement Program. Christine, that's you, I guess. I'll just make some calls while I'm here on <laughs> Joe's phone. All right. Um, all right. Transportation Improvement Program for 2020 to 2023. Um, I handed out copies of the TIP document. If anybody didn't get one, then I have more. Just, so this, most of you have seen this presentation before, so I'm just going to go through pretty quickly, and if there are questions, um, feel free to stop me. But just, I always like to show this slide, which gives kind of um, an overview of the transportation planning process that we carry out here, beginning with a broad vision, goals for the county, and um, through the Metropolitan Transportation Plan transportation plan and the ECOS plan. And from there, we start looking at location-specific issues with planning studies, corridor studies, and the scoping studies then get more specifically looking at improvements in specific locations and alternatives. And once we develop those projects, we look to get funding for the projects and have them move forward in the TIP, which is where we are right now and hopefully moving into um, right-of-way design and construction following that point. So. What is the TIP? Um, it's a document that we're required to prepare. All MPOs across the country are required to make TIPs, transportation improvement programs. And there are specific federal regulations that say how we need to do it and what needs to be in it. Um, just so I think most of you are aware that there is also a state transportation improvement program, the STIP. And that covers the rest of the state outside of Chittenden County. And the TIP is incorporated into the STIP. So the TIP becomes part of the STIP for Chittenden County. Um, so a few important points uh, regarding this <coughs> document. So the TIP is multimodal. It includes all federally funded transportation projects. It must be physically constrained. And that means that there's a dollar limit uh, that can't be exceeded for the TIP. 
So where does the constraint come from? Well, it comes really in a, in a consultative process with VTrans when we're developing this document. And it's based largely on project schedules and their readiness to move forward. And once the TIP is adopted, the limit is set, and we can't go above that amount for any of the years in the TIP. Um, the TIP covers four years. It must be updated at least every four years. Whoops, what did I just do? I'm sorry. It must be updated at least every four years. Um, we follow the schedule that VTrans does for the TIP, so we do it every year. And the TIP authorizes the obligation of federal funds. It's a little bit of uh, kind of obscure language that we use, but basically all that really means is that the obligation is a formal process by FHWA to set aside money to to set aside money for specific projects. So it doesn't mean that the money is spent, but that you say Champlain Parkway here's 10 million, it belongs to you, and then they can spend down on that money. So that's what it is. So how do projects get on the tip? So it's the intent of the federal government that we all work together, right? So um, it's supposed to be a continuing comprehensive transportation planning process. And I think the point of this is so that the federal funds that come to the state, the county, every, everyone is spent according to a plan, a planning process. So we work with VTrans, we work with GMT, we work with um, the airport. Although, I, I will say the airport <coughs> projects are listed in the tip for information, and we don't have authority over those funds. Um, and another important point is that projects in the tip have to be ready to spend the money. So this is um, funds that come from Federal Highway Administration. They have to be obligated before the end of the federal fiscal year. If they're not, then they can go away, and Federal Highway won't obligate the funds unless the projects are ready to go. So. We want to make sure that the projects are ready to go in order to have them in the TIP. And then the, uh, the last piece is that the projects also have to be listed in the Transportation Capital Program, which is what authorizes VTrans to work on projects. So Chicken County, it has to be in the TIP and in the Capital Program. Um, so just a quick overview of what it is, and you have the document in front of you to follow along if you like. So there is an introduction that just says what it is. There's a brief discussion about transportation performance measures in this section. Um, there's an adoption resolution, there's a glossary, there's a map, and then there's the um, section two is the projects by mun municipality. The section three are some tables and figures that give you the overall totals and show the information in different ways. Just very briefly, so this is page one of the tip. Projects are organized by community, we have the project name. There's a, there's a project number that we assign to the project, CCRPC number. There's also a VTrans number. What we're probably most interested in are the dollar amounts in the next four columns. These are the federal funds in each of the four years of the TIP. And there's also the phases, project phases, preliminary engineering, right of way, and construction in that section. Um, there's a comment. This is the most common comment right underneath. Those numbers, funds um, to be obligated in FY19, that's another weird use of language, but what that means is that the project is under construction or we expect it to be constructed this year or shortly into the next year. There's also a comment, new, new projects are identified. Also in the, this location, all circle alternative projects are identified. Um, so these two columns, we have this column that says federal funds obligated through FY18 and FY19 federal funds. Basically, you add those two columns together and you'll have how much has been spent on the project through September 30th of this year. So right before the beginning of this tip. Total project cost, this is in total funds, not federal funds. Um, we have um, project use categories. There's 10 categories that we use just so that we can summarize the projects, the information in different ways. Federal funding source, percent, federal, state, local. Um, and then there's a co comment section that's just any other information that we might want to include. This comment that's highlighted <coughs> that you may not be able to see just lists all the grant funds that were awarded to this project. And last thing, the Trans Project Manager. So um, the overview of what is in this tip, these are the dollar amounts per year, 
76 in 2020, um, 62 in 2021, 61 in 2022, and 48 in 2023 with, for a total of 246 million. <clears throat> so what does that really mean? So this table shows the amount over about the past 10 years of the tips and what you should notice. First thing you might notice is that part of it is green and part of it is blue. The green projects are airport projects um, I put them in a different color just because that's FAA money. It's not something that we can control. We can't direct it in any other place than, than where they want it. And then the blue columns is everything else. And really what you, the one thing that I want you to notice in this table is how much it changes from year to year. And basically the tip is based on projects. There's a long process of developing projects, we all know, and it takes a long time. And so there's, there's a lot of jaggedness there because of the schedules to build projects. We have more projects, they go higher. Projects get snagged in right of way. They, they need some permits, they get delayed. The number gets lower. Um, so just a, a, so this, there's a table at your place that lists all these projects. I'm not gonna talk about all the projects, but if you have any questions um, about specific projects, please ask them. Aviation, that's 14.2% of the total. These are just, a lot of these are grant funded projects that um, the airport submits to FAA for funding. Um, we do have money in there for noise mitigation. I know there's ongoing work on that, so I expect it's not defined what exactly that's gonna be spent on. Sidewalk and path projects, new sidewalk and path projects, so these are just new um, facilities. Their bike ped, <coughs> excuse me, bike ped program and transportation alternative program grants, sidewalk grants, and there's one circle alternative project here. Um, bridge preservation, these are a combination of interstate bridges, state highway bridges, and one town highway bridge, 8% of the total at 19.6 million. <coughs> excuse me. Um, intermodal, we have one project, the Williston Park and Ride, that is set for construction in 2020 right now, 0.9% um, of the total. New facility, major roadway upgrade. This is a little bit of a fuzzy de defined category, but just things that we consider to be major projects. So four projects in this category, Champlain Parkway, exit 17. Exit 17 is requiring reconstruction of the, the US-2 bridges over I-89, so that's gonna be quite a significant project. Um, Crescent Connector and Essex Junction, and then Essex exit 12 improvements in Williston. And um, the first three will be constructed over the three years, four years of this tip, or the, that's the plan right now. Paving, um, we have interstate, site highway, and class one town highway paving. Um, seven projects, 10% 10, 10 of the total cost. Roadway corridor improvements, another kind of a fuzzy definition. Um, just looking at, I think we put exit 16 in this category because while it does add capacity, it's not substantially increasing the footprint of the road, so we're calling it a corridor improvement rather than a new facility major roadway upgrade. It could go in either category, but this is where we've placed it, 3.4% um, of the total. Um, and then this long list is the safety traffic operations and ITS, 15 projects on this list, and these are a combination of signal upgrades, intersection improvements, and rail grade um, crossing improvements, so 14.4% of the total. Transit, um, most of this is, is FTA funds, there's CMAC funds, there's FTA grants, and then elderly and disabled programs, 21.4% of the total. Last column is stormwater environmental. These are the municipal highway and stormwater mitigation program grants and also transportation alternative grants. And um, 3 million, 1.2% of the total. So how does this all stack up? Well, uh, the largest category in this year's TIP is the new facility major roadway upgrade category, followed by transit, ITS, you can see the rest of them come down. Um, I would point out